Hey all, it's KR King of D&D Homebrew. Today talking about creating NPCs for your homebrewed world and specifically how to do it in an easy way that isn't overwhelming, like you have to know everything about these people in your world, and, you know, their whole backgrounds, and you got to have 50 people in every town, all that kind of stuff. You don't need to do that at all. In fact, you can do it, you know, five or six, even just starting with one NPC that you've developed. Because the key is you're going to develop your NPCs as your players explore your world, as they make decisions about what they're interested in doing, you know, where they want to go. And then you, those NPCs that would logically be there, you create a few little features on those, keeping it simple. As always, that's my mantra, right? You create a few features and then the players will provoke actions based, you know, kind of on your general idea of what these people are like, or these humanoids, I should say. And you, they will create they will create reactions that you think are logical, make sense, and then they develop and they develop in relation to the players' interactions. That's the way to do this. And you know, I just started this live campaign almost a year ago now, and I used as the starting NPC the same NPC that I have used since I began playing D and D in the seventies. There was a chain store called Zodies, and it was a real discount. A retail store in the Detroit area where I grew up and a guy in our group bought purple bell-bottom pants. He was a stoner guy. In fact, we were like stoner uh, nerds, right? You know, we loved Leonard Skinner and Led Zeppelin and those kind of bands and yet we loved to play D&D and, you know, I had an afro out there. It's a long time ago, right? But we kind of made fun of these purple bell-bottom pants this guy had, although he thought they were really cool. They had the big heels underneath. So when I created a merchant, kind of the starting point, I named him Zodi. It was Zodi's uh, store. And we thought it was kind of funny and everything, and Zodi became this figure in our game. And then, you know, as the years went by, every time I started a campaign, I always had Zodi as this starting NPC. Sometimes he ran a tavern. Sometimes he was a local guard that had some issue. You know, it was just a tradition to always use Zodi as this, you know, the starting point NPC. And he was different all the time. Sometimes he was an ex-soldier. Sometimes he was a rogue. Uh, sometimes he was just a common sort of folk. I think I had him one time as like this beggar urchin guy or something that ran up to the players and needed help. I, you know, But it was always Zodi. They always knew, here's Zodi, whatever. A little bit of metagame. But I did it with other groups that had no idea who he was, including this group that I'm running now. So when they started off their first adventure, they all met up at Zodi's Tavern. And I had him really well-developed. Uh, more so than I would say in a lot of other NPCs, as we'll see, I said he was a soldier. There'd been this Orkin War 30 years before. He'd fought at it. He'd met this half-orc barbarian, this female. They got married. And, and again, I had one physical description. He wasn't particularly tall, but he was very stout. And she's obviously really tall and big. So that was kind of a Laurel and Hardy thing going on. And he was very gregarious. He had made a big score in this Orkin War 30 years ago, found this treasure, left some of it behind. It's a big secret. He has this magic item that he keeps secret. You know, I had these details if the players got to know him. And then each of the players had some relationship very tangentially. One player was a soldier, so his father fought with uh, Zodi in these, in these Orkin Wars and, and so on. Each of them had a connection. So they all met at Zodi's tavern, met up, decided to go on a run, and I gave them their first mission, which was to take this ale, this super fine ale, up to this town, Manith, to the north of Dramos, the home city, and de and go to this place, Wesgar's Gilded Palace. Manith is this wide open gambling town. So the players did this. They had their first encounter, some bandits that tried to steal the ale. They were, you know, it was an inside job. And they got up there and they're talking to Wesgar. And all I said about Wesgar is he runs this, um, this Gilded Palace, the biggest, you know, saloon, brothel, gambling hall uh, in, in Manith. And what he did was I had this setup where he had this mysterious passenger, Professor Inth, who was coming back with them. And the players are like, wait a minute, we didn't sign on for that. They go, oh, no, Zodi told me you were going to take this guy back and everything. Wait a minute, we, you know, we're not getting paid for this and whatever. So one of the players, one of the first kind of role-playing things that they did, he said, hey, if we're going to do this for you, we, we want some money or we want something, you know what? And here, so Zodi, or, I'm sorry, Wesgar, I had just thought of as a very flashy dresser, kind of guy, lots of rings on, a big cigar, and he runs this gilded palace, and he's surrounded by his thugs, and he's kind of a genial mob boss, right? That's all I had. Because, again, I just I just do the, the... I didn't know with Wesgar they were ever going to meet up with him again, so I just kind of had this idea. But he's also a mob boss. He's also into schemes and opportunities. How did he get to have this gilded palace by taking a chance? 
you know, by rolling the dice, literally, as it were. So here was this character, these kind of neutral parties. These guys were mostly neutral, but this character is actually chaotic, chaotic good, I think. But I had a lot of chaotic neutrals. So they, as it turned out, they loved Mammoth. They loved the wide open, you know, Vegas town. They didn't care for Dramos as much, as we'll see. So I thought, you know what? I'll have a little adventure. He said, well, I'll tell you what. I got this, this druid out in the woods, and, and she wants to, uh, she's got this great weed, pipe weed. You know, we imagine what the, it is in a D&D world. So he said, if you guys come back and deliver Professor Anth, I'll give you as much as Zodi gave you for this to go and negotiate and try to get some weed from her. So they said, okay. So now I got to think about Zodi and I got to think about his setup. And then as they were coming back through the Badlands, they ran and there were these wild folk that lived in the hills. And uh, everyone said, avoid them. They said, stay in the cart. We've got to deliver Professor Inth. But this little girl, this little wild folk girl came running out, said, my father, he's fallen into a pit. Can you help us? Half the group said, absolutely not. But one of the players, a brand new player to D&D just said very naively, hey, if this little girl needs help, I got to go save her. So he goes, and he ends up falling, and then the, the, the chaotic good priest follows along. The rest of them stayed in the cart. The party was split. But they got to know this guy, this wild man. And then the next week, I couldn't remember his name because they, they ended there. So I called him Fred, just to Fred, because I didn't have my notes. And so that became his name. His name was really like, you know, uh, Arcturus or some, you know, <laughs> that's a pseudo medieval name, right? But he became Fred. And Fred I had as kind of reckless and brave and the leader of this group and he had fallen into this hole this spider hole and they saved him they had a big battle with the spiders and uh so now i had fred i had reckless and whatever and actually this uh cleric helped fred he had a competitor in the tribe and he came in and they had this kind of a uh, little bit of a fight or whatever and so fred because he saved him from the spiders they had this ritual where they cut their hands and you know the blood mixes so now they've met fred the npc and he's a friend and the wild folk and they've They've had some interactions with them. So I got three NPCs. I got Zodi, really well-developed. Wesgar and Fred, not so much. So they go back to town. They deliver, Profe oh, and I got Professor Inth. So in each of these guys, Professor Inth, I thought of the character in um, Poltergeist. I think Poltergeist 2, with the broad hat, super emaciated. He's a professor of antiquities. And I've got this ancient race, the Illyrith, this giant, super smart giants that, you know, were annihilated 5,000 years ago. And he's the leading expert and he was delivering an artifact. So he was creepy looking, whatever, but they delivered him and they delivered him this wizard, Karloff. And he's this powerful wizard in Dremel. So now they've got more NPCs they've met. But what did they know about him? What did I know about Inth? Super smart, looked like the guy from Poltergeist 2, and that's it. And that's all they've ever known about him. I mean, they've dealt with him now. They've exchanged antiquities. They give them money. What did I know about Karloff? He was a great wizard in Dramos. Uh, he collected these items. He, he knew that he suspected something's going on with the Illyrith. They're coming back to power. We've got to, you know, cut this off before the evil people do. But that was about it. I didn't know anything more. So I gave him a wife, a half-elf wife, uh, Gwendolyn. One of the characters is a half-elf. Uh, her son went off to search for the Illyrith because Karloff, the father, is so interested in this. And she's she's actually a full elf. I'm sorry. Their son is a half elf. So when she sees this half elf in the group, she has kind of a connection with him. And he's kind of the leader of the party. He assumed this mantle as the group began. So he made a connection. And again, I just threw in, because I knew she was married to an elf. And I just threw in the son and threw that in, you know, kind of an improv thing, right? Just that's it. And that, that is as powerful as describing, you know, you see these books where they say like, you should have a list and they all have a tick and they have a scar on their face and they wear crazy clothes. And, you know, you go down this list and you'll see these PDFs that people put out. You can do all that. And in fact, I had everything for Zodi, you know, marked out. I worked on it before the thing. And as we'll see, they, they never did another thing for Zodi. They had no interest in it. They were interested in Maneth and Whiskar. So I had to develop him. But I just threw out, I saw that I had said that the guy was married to an elf. Obviously, he's this old wizard. <laughs> she looks the same, but her half-elf son died, and so that was a connection. Uh, when they were going through Fred's, I, 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 there's this little girl that I had created. I made her, I couldn't, so her name became Pebbles because it was Fred. His wife was Wilma, and then they had another son, Bam Bam, right? They just The players just suggested this. I went with it. But she became a little fixture. These bandits took over the 
this dagger's rest and she was there working as a barmaid they forced her to work and they were like 10 years old and they're pushing her around the players got really ticked off and got into a fight right because who wants to see a little girl get kicked around and i had just set up oh a little girl lures them do they go and it was a legitimate thing the guy really did fall in the pit it wasn't a trap so now we got these npcs but i'm noticed fred what does he look like i just described it was kind of a rangy guy with dark hair and he's got a beard he never shaves that's it I didn't say any, he, has, he always talks in limericks or he walks with a limp or, you know, all these things you say. Again, if you want to do that. But since he had objective, Wesgar, oh, you guys, guys are kind of, you guys want to take, okay, I'll give you this mission, which they then did to his satisfaction. He became a friend. That's where they hang out now at Wesgar's Gilded Palace. Uh, Fred and the Wild Folk are friends of theirs. They, they, Professor Inth is now, they, they brought him out uh, on occasions to, to look into things. Uh, when they have found artifacts and they get money and everything. But all of these were just barely developed. The people that I had developed were were Zodi, his wife. He had a soldier that worked as this kind of like bartender, bouncer guy. I had them all worked out. I rolled up their characteristics. I didn't have any of these other people even rolled up. So then I needed an opponent. I decided, okay, Wesgar is running this town. Who is his opponent? So I created this character, uh, Vesper, and she is a tiefling warlock. And she runs the opposite gambling hall, but she's connected to the Ezrin clan. All the families, they're not really family, they call themselves clans, but anybody can become a member. A little like a mafia thing, but a little less evil. In fact, some of them are lawful good clans, but that's it's a clan society and you join these clans. So the Ezrin clan were the most powerful, they're sort of the Lannisters, they always pay their debts, but you don't get in debt to them. And I created this because they were doing all this stuff for Wesgar. They, they basically, that became their base of operations was Manith. After I'd set Dramos up, I developed the city in Manith I just had a few notes on. So I began to develop NPCs. I had Vesper. I had this, her partner, Nevis, who was a uh, half-elf cleric. Um, I had some other characters, you know, that I, I, I started to develop Wesgar's various lieutenants, right? And in each case, it came out of the players interacting. They went to man if they were hanging around. So they, they walked around the town. And one of the players wanted to gamble. So I went into this gambling hall. So I had this beautiful tiefling warlock come up and say, oh, you know, because she knew they were doing work for her competitor, Wesgar. So she gave him a few chips, right? But, and, you know, they gamble. I had some gambling games that I'd found online, some D&D gambling games. But now she's a personality, and she's opposed. She's, and, and, and then she sent out bandits to get them at Dagger's Rest. They were enemies with her. And then as they interacted with her, they saw that she was being uh, abused by the son of the head of the Ezrin clan. It's a long story, right? But the point is, I developed those NPCs based on what they did. And the ones that I had developed, Zodi and his group and some other people in Dramos, they had no interest in. How much work have I put into those people? A little bit more. I now know... I know uh, uh, Vesper stats because she actually ended up running with them. It's a long story. The brother Alexor, not the brother, the the person from the Ezrin clan, Alexor. I got his stats. Wesgar is an old rogue. Wesgar's wife is a um, she's a cleric, a Tempest cleric. So I've got her stats. Over the past year, I've developed these NPC characteristics, right? But initially, it was just mob boss, uh, flashy dresser. Uh, kind of reckless, likes to roll the dice because that's how he got to be a mob boss. So when the players interact with him, and by the way, he said, uh, he gave them the money in advance because he said, if you screw me over on this, don't ever come back to Manith and I'll find you. And they are first level guys. Now they're actually, they've rode up, they're like seventh level, or just, just turning seventh level now. And so he's actually, they're actually higher than him. But the point was at the beginning, he was just like, you don't, I, I, and they did, they knew we better do what he says, right? And all of these characters now to them that were just little sketches, you know, mob boss, wild man gets, uh, falls in a spider pit, even Karloff the wizard. Well, then I gave him a wife and then they have a backstory. And then as they interacted with Karloff, they got into this big uh, tribunal in the city of Dramos because they killed these bandits. It's a long story, right? And again, all this stuff, if you look back at my campaign diary, you can see this. When they interacted with them, then things came out. Then I developed relationships. Okay, who's on the tribunal? What are their relationships? And, you know, it took me half an hour to come up with these things. But I wasn't going to do it in advance. I wasn't going to do it until the players had to interact with the council. I wasn't going to develop Wesgar, I did Vesper. All this stuff came out of what they did. I've got a city of Elsinox, biggest city. I wrote out some of the clans that are down there and all this stuff. But I haven't developed that much. Why? Because... The players are going to go there when they go there. 
when the players go into a city and you have a city guard, right? What is their interaction with that guard? So you describe them. Again, I always give a physical. He's kind of a tall guy and he has a little short guy. I have a little pattern there, right? Whatever, there's two of them. Or one's very efficient and he has a, t- uh, you know, a notepad and little glasses and the other one's just a thug who's really dumb. You know, classic two guard thing. Do the players interact? Do they just say, we, you know, we're entering in, we're merchants or whatever? Or do they, do they say, well, what's going on around here? Can you tell us? And then instantly they have a personality. They start to interact with the players. And then you got to think about the persnickety guy is like, don't talk to them. And the oaf guy is like, ah, those guys in that new tavern down the street are causing trouble. And the players will go, let's go to that tavern, right? And there's a pattern then develops when they ask questions. They might, you might just decide they're going to say, and you might do this. You don't always reward them for asking these questions. Let's say you roll one, two, three. They say nothing, four, five, six. They give them some information or however you want to do that if you want to randomize it. But either way, when the players interact with those NPCs that I just created as, again, a Laurel and Hardy archetype or persnickety guy and kind of buffoon guy, they're just that. That's it. And they're two guards. And if the players want to fight them, then you can either say, you know, they're just first level guys or something like that. Or, and again, if the players are going to fight them, then all of a sudden all the city guard comes in and now there's 25. And are they really going to fight those? Maybe. And then you got to sit there and come up with it. But chances are they're just going to interact. But at each phase, if the players decide to talk to, you know, let's say Clyde and Durwood, the two city guards, then you have an opportunity to give them some information. And what these players do, too, they tip people and stuff. They go, oh, you've done a great job. Here's some copper pieces. Or go have a beer to the big oafish guy. He's like, thank you. Now they're his friend or their friend. Now when they go through each time they enter or leave the city, I'll say, oh, they might give you some information. They may say, hey, some people were asking about you, right? Why would they say that? In fact, they... They might be fearful of saying it, unless you're a friend, unless you're interacting. And once the players interact and become friends, you can do a story hook. The persnickety guy, when they're going through, comes to them and says, you know, my my sister's disappeared and I don't know what to do. And I know you guys are great adventurers and I just wanted to tell you. And they, you know, they're going to buy it. They're going to know I'm setting something up. It's a game, right? But they're also going to have a relationship with Persnickety where he has maybe let them pass one time when he shouldn't have or something like that if they have befriended him. Because relationships in the D&D world should be just like real life. You treat people well, they'll treat you well. If you treat them like dirt, they're going to not like you. And when the players begin to realize that, they will make the, those amends. They will become, And then when they get renowned and stuff, that's a whole other thing, then the NPCs come to them. But in the beginning, when I created these NPCs, and I'll tell you, if you talk about Fred, if I talk about Wesgar, Vesper, Professor Inth, they they will, even though I've only given very cursory sketches, because they have interacted, because they have a relationship with these imaginary characters, they could tell you, oh, yeah, that Inth, he's a weird dude, man. He's got this hat on and his face is all pale. And, you know, Gwendolyn is this elven... Think she's she's a superdome. I can't remember, but you know she's this mysterious figure who has this sort of beatific smile. That's what I gave her. She has this sort of always a little bit of a smirk on her face, right? And it's just because that's the way her. I, I didn't write anything more than that, but I told them that, and they're sort of like, hmm, you know, what does that mean, right? Just one little thing, because I didn't I didn't roll her up. I didn't develop her. I didn't do anything. I, I mean, I have now, right? Because as you go along, as you'll see with a homebrew campaign, when you run one, you do have to do some work. You do have to come up with the characters. But in this instance, the, all the work that I did, creating Zodi and his whole thing, in honor of that long tradition that I started so many 40 plus 45 years ago, or more, oh my God, it's like 47. I'm old. Um, all that stuff that I did to honor that tradition, the players didn't go for. They had no interest in Dramos. They wanted to hang out in Manif, the crazy, the, the, the Vegas town. So, that's where all the MP, well, and some of them, a lot of the NPCs in my world have developed because they go exploring and whatnot. So again, the key here with these NPCs is when the players interact, make you know, all they have to do is a few things, a little physical thing, maybe a personality, whatever. The job that they do, a city guard acts a certain way, a you know, mob boss, uh, gambling hall owner acts a certain way, a professor of antiquities acts another And then that's it. And then if the players choose to continue, if they just dropped Professor Inth off and moved on, that would have been it. They never seen him again. 
But because they wanted to find out what was going on, they saw this, and they asked, what is this place? And what, oh, that's the wizards and everything. And I think they interacted with Professor Int as well. They were really scared of him at first. I made him super creepy, if you've seen that guy from the Poltergeist movies. So they actually, at first, they didn't want to. But then they, you know, human nature being what it is, and he didn't seem like a bad guy, they started interacting, asking questions and everything, and they found out he was with Illerith, and they're all interested in that. So that opened something up. So now all those NPCs are like living people to my players. And all I had to have was just, you know, a couple of notes, what they did, and then think logically. If, if they had asked him, what are, what, what's in your antiquities bag? He would have said, oh, nothing, just because he would, I would keep it secret, right? So Inth was not just going to tell them everything. And they got that sense, right? Then, of course, that made him more curious. But they knew not to. Wesgar said nothing should happen to Professor Inth, right? Because he has a relationship with... Uh, the wizard, and it's a long, complicated thing that has developed as the players have discovered what's going on. What is this thing with the Illerith, right? And in each stage, I did this based on what they did. I didn't write up a whole bunch of stuff and then get all bitter <laughs> when they ignored Zodi. I just said, that's what happens. They ignored him. So that's the way you want to do it. So you can set up, you can do as much pre-work as you want. Just remember, they may not, they may just go for the most bizarre, obscure thing in your world. It's just, I run a sandbox. I don't, I don't railroad. I take it a point of pride not to railroad, right? Although I give them all these opportunities and I say, you know, and then they see other people get, take them and they go, okay. But when you're doing that sandbox and you got to create those NPCs, they get created as they get created. But as you can see, just a few things, just act the way they are, and I guarantee you, your players will feel like they're real people, which is what we're trying to do. So I hope that's helpful. If you like my channel, subscribe. Uh, always looking for more. Leave some comments, how you create NPCs. Maybe some of you have elaborate charts. I've seen them out there. But most importantly, keep playing an RPG game, whichever one you like, and tell somebody else about it.